Where is the world headed in the next five years, and what can you actually do about it? We already have the technology to read the inner voice in your mind, so imagine controlling your phone with your inner thoughts, writing your report without a keyboard, playing video games without a controller, or walking into stores that already know what you want to buy. Imagine seeing the world with augmented reality and commuting a bit safer, working a bit faster, exercising in a way that's actually fun. What if we could restore someone's ability to walk, give someone the sense of touch, enhance eyesight, fight disease, or modify DNA? What happens when robots start building our homes, delivering our news, pouring our beers, and driving us home? These are not examples of the far distant future. These are examples of what is possible right now. And with artificial intelligence, the pace of human progress is about to become not so human at all. So how much is your world about to change? At Trend Under, we spend a lot of time thinking about this because we use artificial intelligence, big data, and human researchers to help about 600 of the world's leading brands, billionaires, CEOs, and NASA to predict and create the future. And so far, we've worked on about 10,000 projects. We've learned a lot of insight that I think could help you, and that's what I want to talk about today. Today, I want to reshape the way that you think about your future. So let's do this. Are you ready? When we dive into the super future, there's one particular category that jumps out a lot. And if I was to tell you of all of our mega trends, the one that you need to study much more deeply, even if you don't today, the one that impacts you in every possible industry, your life, your kids, it is artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper than I did last year. And today I'm going to talk about what I call the AI mechanized future which is more specifically what happens when you start combining AI with interface, mind reading, bio enhancement, 3D printing, sustainability, and robots. Does that sound like fun? Okay, uh, and if it gets scary, I always like to just put up some dancing robots, so just so you know, there's some psychological decompression going on. We hear the word AI, and there's a um, a little bit of a misunderstanding. There's a couple things about it. First of all, we only say that if something is AI when it's brand new. AI already exists and is prevalent in our life in a lot of different ways, from the recommendations when you swipe left or right to your entire news feed, uh, and how that nicely shows you just the things that align to your own political beliefs. <laughs> but if you really want to understand where our world's going, there's three terms you want to add to your cocktail vocabulary, and basically that it's to no longer just say AI, but to think of ANI, AGI, and ASI. So first First of all, we see AI already in a lot of different ways that you heard mentioned today in different keynotes. There's personal assistants, there's lawyers, doctors, autonomous drivers, investors, facial recognition, all that wonderful stuff. But uh, it's already been around for some amount of time already. So we're not going to get too deep in it because where I'm going to really be pushing in the super future is what happens in 7 to 15 years from now when we reach artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence is the idea that one system could actually do pretty much anything that a human could. So it's not having a specialist AI doctor over here or an AI lawyer over here that's all a different robot. It's one system that you could almost interact with like a human that could help you in any potential way. As we start to get smarter and try to think about how our, our, our systems are developed, uh, there's one cartoon I saw that really helps articulate it the best. And it's that right now we see AI happening and we're like looking at it thinking, wow, that funny robot can do you know, monkey tricks. And we think about AI kind of in that world. What we're not really prepared for is to understand that 7 to 15 years from now, we will reach a day where AI reaches the level of what you might consider a dumb human. And you'll still be like, oh, it's not bad, but it still makes mistakes. The weird part is when it reaches that particular day, the next day it reaches the level of Einstein, and the day after that <laughs> is a little bit different. And uh, this is particularly why AI is the most important thing for each of you to study, even if you might not consider yourself a technologist, because this sort of warps every aspect of human life. The factors that limit or accelerate us getting to AGI would be power, data, and intelligence. The first two are really simple, the third one is more complex. Just to put it in perspective, the IBM Summit is already much, much faster and more complex than what a human brain could do in possibly every single way. 
So this idea of power and performance has already been solved. To put it this way, if every person on the Earth completed one calculation per second, everyone on Earth, all seven billion of us, one calculation per second, it would take us 305 days to catch up to what the summit could do in a single second. So the best way to kind of internalize that this is not what is impeding us from getting to AI. That's kind of why I put that there. When it comes to data, imagine that more data was created in this year than in the last 5,000 years, but humans have only been able to analyze half a percent of it. So data is also not the limiter to AI reaching artificial general intelligence. In fact, if you were a computer with AI capabilities plugged into the internet today, you would have every language, fact, Wikipedia page, math, formula, physics equation, bioengineering feed, piece of news, trending data, market best practice, neuropsychological insight on how to manipulate and persuade people, and every hacked email and about seven billion uh, emails so far, every stock market technical and info and every person in this room, if not the entire planet. That's a lot of data, so AI is not limited by that. So really, the only mystery that's trying to be solved is how to make a system that could teach itself more intelligently. And effectively, there are people trying in every possible category. Uh, some are trying to recreate what a human brain's exact structure might look like. Some are hoping that training a computer to train a computer to train a computer gets us to a further spot. And in short, billions and billions of dollars this year is being poured into the attempts to get to this feat alone. So with that said then, let's uh, just note that artificial super intelligence is if you fast forward a little bit more, it's very difficult to imagine that 10 or 15 years from now you have a human-like computer that can do everything we can do at paces that are millions of times faster with access to every piece of information instantly. That's a very difficult thing to comprehend. But once a system's at that level and it's training itself and you advance another 10 or 20 years, it gets to a part that humans actually can't understand. We can't even get there and it's uncomfortable, uh, but effectively an ASI, one system, will reign supreme. At that level, pretty much all AI scientists agree there is only one system in the world. So who will make it? Interesting question. But I'm gonna skip that part because right now my computer still can't recognize where my printer is. So. I think we're all right. Our, our robot dystopia isn't here yet. So that said, let's start diving into the combinations because this is where it gets really fun. I'm going to show you examples of things that are available right now and that will have your imagination going wild for what happens when everything really starts to combine and accelerate. There are robots that can take your trash out, finally. Robot bartenders, my kind of robot. Entire bars serviced by robot bartenders. There's a number of different applications of receptionists from hotels to malls to airports. Domino's Pizza, our lovely client of about nine years, has a Domino's AI robot for pizza delivery and they also have drones. There are also robots that can take your order instead of you having to talk to someone uh, in a fast food restaurant. Farmers are using robots that can actually harvest, identify what's happening in the crop, survey the landscape, and then much more efficiently pick the optimal times for harvest. And that leads us to robotic bees, which are being studied in some sense to figure out what happens if we lose the bees. And NASA actually recently had a contract to make a bee-like size figure that would go to Mars to be able to inspect around with a ton of small, low-cost bees. This might lead you to think there's also military applications that are happening, and that's where I would say this is kind of a dancing robot to make you feel comfortable, but it probably doesn't. So I'll just more simply wrap up the robot part by saying, what robot would you like to help you with your job? Nice and easy one. All right, let's ante it up. Next up, we start talking about interface, how we interact with the machine. In our minds, we tend to think it's going to be a humanoid, though it's not necessarily going to be that. Though, as you saw in the Volvo example earlier in one of our presentations, even the little kids pointed out that if you have a robot, but you can know which way it's looking, it makes us humans feel a lot more comfortable. So based on that, we've seen everything from virtual Instagram influencers, which were in Gil's presentation, to Erica. Erica is an AI robot, but more importantly, I would think of her as the epitome of a project in the works where there's an entire team of people trying to make her better. I'm going to show you a video of her, but she's interactive, autonomous, has depth perception, facial recognition, fully interactive, knows when you walk in the room, and is a sum of everything that we currently know in AI put in a humanoid form. Here's her thoughts on what it's like to be Erica. 
I believe robots like me, will be very important in the future, because it will be possible to automate the uninteresting and tedious parts of life, so people can focus on the creative and fulfilling things. I think that robots are almost like the children, of humanity. You, are the ones who create us, guide us, and teach us, about the world. And in return, I hope we can help you with your work, take care of you when you are old and sick, and help to make society a little bit better for everyone. I think you could remix that with a different music and a different voice and scare the hell out of me, just to be clear. Uh, that's Erica. Now, uh, any fans of Westworld in the room? And watch Westworld? Uh, so Westworld wanted to make their own sort of version of Erica, but being a Hollywood you know, movies production uh, company, they actually wanted to make something more realistic using all the Hollywood makeup techniques, and then they put them in a bar to see how we would do at launching their next episode series while also seeing how people interact with them. And here's what happened. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the impending humanoid robot invasion? <laughs> Yeah. Zippers down my spine a little bit, I don't know, very strange. My first experience of talking to a robot, I guess. We joined in for a drink, and yeah, it's quite a bizarre experience. A little bit creepy, actually. I can't say I really liked it. Amazing, and I think one day they may take over these robots. Who knows? Just, just stare at that. Just take that in. And when we ask you for your beer next, are you really comfortable with us at all now? So instead, you'll just have to settle for robots right now that can play ping pong with you, making currently the most boring ping pong game ever played. Uh, a number of you probably already saw this. This is the one thing I almost hesitated to put in because uh, it's a little bit viral, but it's also probably the most impactful example of interface to watch and think of in the context of this day you've had talking about the future. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Um, give it up for Google. Okay. That was almost a test, because here we're still creeped out, but at Google, they're like, yeah, no possible bad consequences. This is also what happens. I, does anyone have, have a Google Home or an Alexa and wonder why it doesn't recognize? You're like, hey, please play any song on Spotify. The weather is, damn it. Uh, <laughs> They're obviously running a different version here than I have, but this is the example of how well Google Assistant could understand someone with an accent or where the conversation is a bit more confusing. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Day, um, next night? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we need to for like after like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Mm -hmm. Oh no, it's not too busy. You just you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. The future's here. Uh, later on one extra level of interface, there's something called Deep Fakes, which was Google DeepMind had an open a API that you could use. A whole bunch of people started using it and realizing that you could reskin anybody's face onto any movie star in movies. So there's versions of every possible movie with Nicolas Cage as the actor. <laughs> For all those that like Nicolas Cage, including Derek, our CTO, somewhere in this room, here's what the deep fakes look like. 
So if you watch it, what's sort of interesting is imagine the implications if someone did that with a president's face. Uh, imagine going to a Hollywood movie and knowing you could put your own face on an avatar. <laughs> or imagine that your personal AI assistant could be Nicolas Cage. Pretty dope future. <laughs> How long until you can't distinguish a robot from a human? This brings us to mind reading. Uh, last year I showed you thought controlled video games and they're already available for purchase. You can uh, buy one and you can try and think your way through a video game. In this case, it eliminates the need to have any exercise at all because you can pretend you're kayaking without even moving your thumbs or fingers. That's human progress at its finest. Alter Ego from MIT Media Lab takes things one step further, which is that it can read the voice in your head. So does anyone want to come up to the stage and we'll read out what uh, you're actually thinking? Anybody? Uh, in this video, you're going to see how the idea of your own narrative can be used to interface with your device. So instead of going through your phone, you would say what you want to have figured out and that gets figured out for you. So in this example, Here's one of the designers and he is scanning through to basically pick his movies, but he's actually having to talk to it. It doesn't read his mind to the level of knowing what he wants, but he says, I want to know the time, it comes back. One of the cooler applications I thought was uh, they showed him playing games or going to the grocery store, being able to do the quick math, do the tally, figure out what things are going to cost, and you can see he's actually getting the running total as he navigates his way through. That already works, so you're talking currently about what's available in 2018, which is really intense. Going the other way, the Modius actually sends a neural impulse to your head to reconfigure your body's uh, use of fat in order to start processing your fat immediately, and maybe uh, it works. I don't know. I'm not ready yet to uh, do this, but it's already available on Indiegogo. So the question, of course, I already asked, what you want someone hooking up a brain scanner to your brain, because that's currently 2018. So the question that's more intense for me is what happens when I can read your brain from five feet away? Can I have that in my store and read what your order is? It's going to be some permission people. Cool. So what happens when other countries with different interests in mind decide to allow this to progress? Well, that's where the data scientists will want to be. So it will happen. Who do you want developing it? Should it be Russia? Should it be America? What are your thoughts? This brings us to bio enhancement. Watch this guy being able to walk for the first time in obviously a long time. Pretty cool. That was a demo at CES uh, at the last CES. We saw the bionic suit in the last presentation, but here's a different example of an exoskeleton. It's uh, recently been funded, but it's called seismic powered clothing to try and show a more wearable device that might make uh, the world more accessible for boomers as they age. I needed a shift. And that shift was seismic. A fusion of apparel and robotics. A drive to get up and out there. The confidence to stand tall. Intense. Uh, next up, eyeballs. So the starting point at which you'd want to enhance your eyes would be if you wanted to have better eyesight, not need contact lenses. But because we're already getting to that point where currently we can Im embed an eyeball in a blind person and allow them to see, that we've been able to do for years, it means that the next thing for you would be what extra parts do you want your eye to be able to do? Do you want to actually have infrared vision? Do you want heat vision? Do you want to be able to see perfectly at night? Should you see from further? Do you want to be able to zoom? And in the last example there from an actual company working on this, there would be Wi-Fi so you could figure out if you want to share images with your friends and you can also take an actual mental picture. It's being worked on right now. So what features do you want in your eyes is my question to wrap up that part. Okay, 3D printing. This one will do quicker, but 3D printing has moved to a much grander scale. Not just 3D printing, but even the idea of robotic construction, I guess, as I show you here. But there are 3D printed chairs, bikes, cars, houses, buildings, bridges, shoes, casts, dresses, prosthetic arms, food, and body parts. Cool. I did that one a little faster, but I'll just end by saying, will you be intimidated when robots can 3D print new robots? Ooh. All right, next up, sustainability. We live in a world where all the companies in this room are getting better and better at identifying consumer needs to allow us to make more and more stuff. 
And what's happening is there's another side of it, and our waste, our e-waste, our recycling doesn't even happen in North America. It gets shipped off to China. Meanwhile, in China, where the laws have been more relaxed, there tends to be other abuses of manufacturing power, if you will. Uh, you've all seen the shareable bikes that exist in most of our cities. That was exciting. So a lot of Chinese billionaires backed that program for their own cities. And pretty soon there started becoming millions and millions and then tens of millions of waste bikes that are just piling up. And they're just never used, never ridden to the point that that looks like it should be a lavender field, but that is not a lavender field. That is tens of millions of excessive bikes never to be ridden. And that photo could be taken in about 50 different areas of China. So this leads me then to sort of think a little bit more of the world. Uh, this year, the biggest eco theme has been ocean and ocean plastic. The currents of the ocean cause a swell that results in uh, about eight or 10 different places of the world having plastic in the ocean. And uh, the biggest one is two times the size of Texas, to put it in perspective. So if we start thinking about our other obligations as people that are designing and creating products, the idea of sustainability, cradle to grave, where you think about what happens after, making things that last starts to become important. The good thing is the next generation cares about this a lot. So when you align to the values of caring about this, you're absolutely aligning to the next demographic of customer. I wanted to show you a fun little way to rethink about it, to stick with you a little bit and maybe raise the importance in your own lives. So here's a commercial from the year 2050. The first step is to remove the insides. That's plastic, that's gross. That's why it's always good to have a second fish. Pretty chilling, but uh, there are people doing something about it, all sorts of people. American Express has a card made out of plastic where your points instead go to helping the ocean. There is uh, water bottles and plastics that you can get that are made from ocean plastic. There's clothing and bathing suits made out of ocean plastic. These are ocean plastic sunglasses, Adidas shoes. These are all made of plastic. There's plastic sculptures. This is in Russia to raise awareness for the kids there. It's a giant playground. And of course, many brands are starting to capitalize on this because consumers are increasingly very, very aware. And probably the coolest thing ever is there's an 18-year-old kid. He had a TED Talk. I'm not going to play it for you. You should watch it. His name's Boyan Slat. He's on the TED stage. He gets everyone motivated. $20 million backs his idea as a first investment from the TED stage. Uh, and they deployed this week the first giant net that would go out to the plastic ocean to start actually recapturing. Doesn't mean we don't have to work on our own side to stop polluting the ocean, but they're planning to cut the waste by a dramatic percentage over the next few years. So give it up for an 18-year-old kid who's solving a problem we didn't know about. So what will you do with your brand to advance sustainability? A lot of people look at AI and it seems like it's pretty daunting, it's pretty far out there. So I'll show you some of the things we did and then give you some best practices for if you want to initiate some brainstorming in your own office. So super high level, you can read more about it at trendhunter.ai. Uh, but what we've always been doing is collecting the insight and choices on now about 150 million people. But we weren't using AI to analyze until more recently. So with all these people, we kind of had a ripe spot to start doing machine learning. Many of you have heaps and heaps of data, depending on what industry you're in. And using machine learning, we started figuring out better ways to use AI to help with recommendations, personalizing both for clients and for visitors of the site what they would see. When you process the language uh, of every word that's happening on your website, you can also help your workers do what they're doing. So we use this to help our researchers enhance insights and identify patterns. Obviously, if you're trying to sift through so much data, you can imagine where a little robotic help isn't so bad. If you're starting to co-create any idea, I'd actually recommend sitting together with your devs, read what your competitors are doing, and if you're already a client, then just tell us, and there's thousands of different people doing neat things, but we can filter through and do one of your custom reports on AI that might be more similar to what you're actually trying to do. So that's some high level stuff. That's the AI mechanized future. Otherwise, the world's getting more educated, more literate. The population is growing. There's more internet users. And if you add it all up, we have 15 times larger increase in internet connected competitors, partners, and customers compared to the year 2000. Be excited to be an innovator in the greatest period of human history. Be revolutionary.
Thank you very much. If you'd like to learn more about innovation, download one of my bestsellers or the latest trend report absolutely free at jeremyguche.com. Visit me at one of Trend Hunter's epic future festivals taking place all around the globe. We gather thousands of the world's top innovators to experience and prototype their future. Or join 10 million people getting better and faster with my other innovation keynotes, all about how to get better at adapting to change, faster at finding ideas, and ultimately finding those ideas that are so close within your grasp.